What's up, everybody? Pumpkin here. So, yeah, Usurper. Um, today on stream, at the very beginning, my goal was very simple. I wanted to create a deck that did well against Detlaf. Detlaf is, I mean, if you've been playing Crimson Curse at all, uh, you've been seeing a lot of Detlaf. Detlaf is very, very good. There will be some times where you'll queue into Detlaf for 8, 10 games in a row. He's just that good. Everybody is playing him. Anybody on Pro Ladder who wants a high monster Pro Ladder score is playing Detlaf because he's very abusable, he's very strong. Play Detlaf. Um, so my goal was very simple. Beat Detlaf. Um, and I thought to myself, well, Usurper kind of completely denies the uh, his ability, which is kind of nice. And Nilfgaard kind of has the tools to do what you need to do to beat a mid-range deck. So there's two ways to beat a mid-range deck, which is what Detlaf is. Um, you go in one direction, which is you be more control-oriented. So a really, really heavy no-unit uh, control deck does beat mid-range, right? The idea of this is mid-range decks, um, they play a unit and they do damage to a unit, right? So like a Frit, an example, is a four that deals four. If your opponent doesn't have any units, well, a Frit loses half of its value immediately, right? So if you play a no-unit deck, uh, all the cards that deal damage lose half their value immediately, uh, and that obviously hurts the deck. So uh, one example of this, I was playing like a Francesca deck. The only um, unit you played was the Immune Dragon, uh, and you'd play Renew twice with like Francesca. This deck is kind of cute. The problem with this type of deck is if you queue into any deck that plays actual points that's not mid-range, you just auto-lose because you just can't deal with the amount of points that like a point deck can output, right? So the other scenario that beats mid-range is just a ton of points. Um, so historically, um, back when like F made mid-range was popular um, before Crimson Curse, the worst matchup for an F made mid-range deck or really any mid-range deck was Gurnacora. Um, because Gurnacora is basically just point slam. Uh, mid-range decks can't deal with the amount of points it, uh, that it outputs because typically the way mid-range works is you deny your opponent's engines uh, and you trade up on their cards. But point slam, you can't trade up on point slam other than like Scorch, but Scorch is kind of hard to get good value out of. So typically point slam, Gurnacora, big monster decks would just destroy mid-range, right? And so that was kind of the goal with this deck. Um, it is an Usurper deck. Based on the name, it is Human Usurper, right? So we utilize Doppler. Every other card in the deck is human other than the Roach. Um, and if you look at the deck a little bit more closely, there is zero control in it. There is not a single point or a single card that has control in it, right? So typically in a Nilfgaard deck, you have uh, Cavalry, which allow you to lock your opponent cards, or you play like the Letho ox Seret combo, which is super, super popular in basically every Nilfgaard deck, we don't play those cards because those cards suck in a control meta, right? If your opponent's not playing any engines, your locks are losing all value. You're not getting any value whatsoever on those types of cards. And so against a very heavy Detlaf meta, uh, those cards are useless. They're terrible. You should not be playing them. Um, so the idea of this deck is every single card in this deck is points. Uh, and yeah, it's just points. It's a lot of points. Um, and the other thing is uh, dominance. So dominance is a very popular uh, mechanic in monsters. Basically, if you have the highest unit, you have a, an additional ability. The main cards that use this are uh, Wild Hunt Riders and Proto Flutter, um, both of which are auto included in every um, that laugh list at the moment. So the idea was we're gonna point slam, we're gonna deny their ability, and we're gonna never give them the ability to have dominance. Uh, and that's kind of how this list came to be. Um, originally, the list didn't have Count Caldwell in it, but after rotating Count Caldwell into the deck, the, the win rate, we just won every single game. Like, actually won every single game. To the point where we beat, I believe, Freddy, Adzakov, Crozer, and Ife Bowman uh, in a matter of maybe six to eight games apart from each other. Uh, all of which were playing Detlaf. So, that's actually, I'm going to have all four of those games for you. Uh, I'm going to have two in this video, and then I'll have another video with the other two, just so that the video is not too long. Um, all four of those games are Detlaf to, you know, explain to you or try to show you how to play this deck against Detlaf. The most important thing is to deny dominance. I can't stress that enough, right? This is not a deck that just auto wins Detlaf. If you play this deck and you queue into Detlaf, you don't just win, right? It doesn't work that way. Detlaf is strong enough. Monsters as a faction is strong enough where you can't just auto win the matchup. It's just not going to happen. Um, but if you do play um, fairly well, you do pilot the deck well, uh, and you 
play to deny dominance, uh, you can come out ahead. There's also one other very big thing. Um, that left decks have kind of uh, rotated. So the, the first day, first three days of that laugh was heavy control. Um, heavy control is really good, but it's not good against uh, like point slam. So what uh, that laugh's lists have been doing is they've been running cards like Count Caldwell, um, Spear Tip, and Azrael, right? These are higher strength cards that can just slam for a large points. So the idea is it's very control oriented still, but you still have these high tempo cards or um, high tempo finishers. So we kind of have to work around that. Uh, and that's why we play Count Caldwell as well, obviously, so that we can get the 10 for eight, which is very, very strong. Um, and we can abuse the fact that everyone is playing Count Caldwell because this card right here, Emissary. Emissary seems like a weird card in the list, right? We're not playing any Enforcers. We're not playing any kind of spice energy. Why on earth would we play this card? Well, because you can boost a unit by plus seven. Um, and in a Caldwell meta, which is kind of what we're in because it is super high points for cheap provisions, um, having tall unit is of the utmost importance and emissary obviously helps with that. It's like a free swallow potion. Slightly better because your Dopplers still get full value when you have this in your deck. But more importantly, or an extra feature is it procs Gorgon. Uh, Gorgon is also human, so it works very well. Every, every card in this deck is human. Um, I'll go through the list really quickly, um, but th there's a lot of synergy in this list. Not even, yeah, it's great. Um, Jermaine, this wasn't originally in the list either, but I found that it's really, really helpful because um, A, it's an eight, which is not bad. Originally I had Tibor, but Tibor falls into tall removal and 13 is kind of awkward. I don't mind them removing my Gorgon or my Caldwell, but removing a 13 just feels weird because you're also pulling a card for your opponent. Jermaine was a, a solid eight and it's extra bodies for slave infantry. Uh, people say, well, why on earth do you want to play this card in a Gorgon meta? People just get free ticks with uh, their Gorgon on your cows. Yeah, that's true. But the reality is, if you're playing Gorgon, they can always find those ones, right? Every deck that plays Gorgon is Ethne, Bruver, uh, Detlaf, Crack, right? All of these decks can easily find uh, one drops or set them up. So if you give your opponent more, it doesn't really matter, right? So the uh, so the obvious synergy is you play this card and it works well with Slave Infantry, right? Because you're flipping a one and that's much better than flipping any other type of unit. Um, but what's also really nice is Vivian. Vivian's a new card with Crimson Curse. You get to set a unit's power to its provisions costs. So Vivian, the two main targets in this deck are Roach, right? Roach is 10 provisions for three. Uh, you get to pull it back out with a Sire in round three. It's a very normal uh, combo. When you Vivian it, it's plus seven on Roach or plus seven on Jermaine, both of which are good. Uh, and both of these factor into having highest unit for dominance. So once again, th this deck is super, super focused on beating monsters because you just, as long as you have that high unit, they can never play Caldwell and they lose value on like Riders or Proto Flutters or Wild Hunt Hounds or Riders. So yeah, high unit. That's just everything you're going for. So Vivian, it's a strong card. It's a 10 for 10 typically, which you might think, well, 10 for 10, is, is that good enough? Well, the answer is yes, it is good enough, right? Pro Proto Flutter is a 10 for 10 in Monsters. We're denying that down to 7 for 10 because we do get dominant. But it's a big finisher for Nilfgaard that Nilfgaard typically doesn't have. Nilfgaard typically plays like these mid-range cards. Most the average big Nilfgaard card doesn't get more than 7, 8 value. So 10 for 10 is good because it's just it's good enough. So Vivian, really strong card. Really like it. I believe in one game, my opponent made like a 15-point crone and I used Vivian like a Peter because I needed to deny his dominance and Vivian just had that flexibility. So every now and then you're going to use this offensively to deny dominance. Uh, Shieldard, obviously a very good card because you want to deny dominance and brings their highest unit down. Uh, if you do Q into Squayatel with this deck, hold on to this card until they play Ithlin. Once they play Ithlin, slam Shieldard, it'll bring a Skaggs from like 11 to 1 and you just saved yourself 20 points. This card is insanely good in the meta right now. Um, I think in four games today, I played Shillard and it hit their Caldwell and their Caldwell went to one and they had to discard it because it's just a dead card. Um, yeah, so really strong card. I typically save this for round three unless I'm getting blood in round two, in which case I slam it. Yeah, I almost never, ever, ever play this round one. Gorgon, obviously one of the best cards in Crimson Curse. It's an 11 for nine. Uh, it does have that shield, which is kind of nice. Um, you have multiple ways to proc this. You have um, you have the emissaries, which we talked about a little earlier. You also have Shieldard if they do play that unit, um, and we also have this one, Cutthroat, 
which allows you to bleed a unit. I'll, I'll, I'll go into why we run these two cards in a little bit, but basically there, there are enough ways to proc this card off that you should almost always get it. And it's a big unit, which is really good for dominance. Uh, it's also good against uh, Neckers. And that left players are starting to play Neckers again. So good card. This is a card I don't mind playing in round one. If my opponent opens with Neckers and I have Gorgon, I'm slamming that Gorgon immediately. I don't care. Uh, denying Neckers is fine. Also getting Roachrod in round one with this deck can be tricky at times because there are golds that you typically don't want to play in round one. Typically, I don't want to play Vivian, Jermaine, Shelaird. Count, I'm okay with playing in round one. I don't want to play a Sire. I don't want to play Vareem D. Peter, don't really want to... I could. The point is, it's very hard to get Roach out in round one. Typically, I actually pull it out in round two because my opponents try to bleed me, and that that's that's where the, the power of this deck comes in to play, uh, is when you get bled, because you can keep up in points because this deck is very point-oriented. So, uh, Gregory, very strong card. Count Caldwell, super, super strong. Um, nobody expects... Uh, Nobody expects this card. When you play against monsters and they bleed you in round two, they're thinking, oh, Nilfgaard. Nilfgaard sucks. They don't have points. You slam a Caldwell and they don't know what to do because it's a 10. And typically there's a Roach attached to it because I haven't played a gold. And it's a 13 point play and your opponent has no idea what to do. Um, they'll start hitting it. They'll start playing their own tall units. And you just don't care because you can also play tall units because you have cards like Vivian. Uh, and you have Emissaries. Emissaries are such a good card in this deck. Um... This is another one of the stars in the deck because it is a high, high point play. And you can keep it. It's it's very... I don't think... There's maybe one game my Count Caldwell got stolen and I just stole it right back the next turn. So very, very strong card in this deck. Great card. Love the card. Um, a Sire. With Roach, it's a 9 for 8. It's good. It procs your Vivian with Roach, obviously. Very strong card. Don't really need to talk about it. Reem D. Very good with Slave Infantry. Slave Infantry get a lot of value in this deck because of Dramine. Uh, I don't mind playing this card in round one. Sometimes I will play this on Impera Brigades if I'm playing against uh, monsters because I just want to pull that Roach out. You don't have to save this for Slave Infantry in round three. Not a big deal. You can just play Slave Infantry by themselves in round three on Jermaine. You don't have to have Reem D. So uh, play this at your discretion in round one. If you want to win the round, which typically you do against monsters or really any deck, uh, feel free to play this card because pulling out Roach is really nice because it allows you to aggressively mulligan uh, and it allows you to unbrick your sire in round two or three. Uh, save infantry, uh, very good card, obviously. Peter, so Peter, Peter's a lot of fun. It's a good card, obviously, against monsters because monsters are starting to play Osral now because they're running uh, Caldwell. So what's really interesting is because of the the whole P uh, Caldwell meta, um, a lot of the times because of the way Caldwell works. For those of you who don't know how Caldwell works, uh, I'll, I'll go back up to Caldwell. Caldwell flips at the end of the turn. At the end of the person's turn who owns Caldwell, right? So if I have Caldwell on the board and my opponent doesn't have above a 9, right? Uh, and it's my final play and they play a 12, it's not going to flip over because it has to be at the end of my turn, right? And at the end of their turn, the, uh, it passes and the game ends. So it's at the end of the person's turn who owns Caldwell. So you can use this to your advantage. If you don't have last say against monsters, typically monsters are going to want to steal the Caldwell back. Uh, and the way that they're going to do this is cards like Osrel, right? Osrel onto a Caldwell that they had played maybe in round one or two uh, is an 11, which allows them to steal the Caldwell. But they have to play it before your final turn, which means what I typically do is I hold on to Peter as my last card. Now, normally, Peter doesn't deny Osrel if you don't have last say because they simply hold on to Osrel for the very end of the game because they want to play around cards like Leo and Peter. But... If they want to steal Caldwell, well, they have to play it a turn early, and this obviously works in our advantage. So they'll typically play the Osral as their second to last card, and I get to get a full value 13 point Peter against their Osral. So um, there, there are some very cool mind games you can play with like uh, Caldwell and Peter. Uh, it, it, it's a lot of fun, and when it goes off, it, it feels so satisfying. So uh, do, do keep that in mind. Para Brigade, uh, it's a good thinning card. Works well with Reem D in round one. It's targets for your slave infantry. It's just a good card. Uh, and it's human. Did I mention everything in this deck is human? Emissary, we've talked about this card a lot. Works super well with Gorgon. Works really, really well with Caldwell. It, it ensures that you have that highest unit. Uh, it allows you to steal your opponent's cards. And it's just a... It's, it's pretty good. It's a 6 for 7. Or... Yeah. No. 5 for 6. No. 6 for 6. I can't do math. This card's great. I love this card. It's a human. There's no downside of this card. Sure, it plays into tall removal, but there's only most people only play Geralt at the moment, um, and that's not a big deal. It's a good card. I really like this card in this deck. Dopplers! 
Another star of the deck, um, this allows you to boost, it boosts itself based on how many humans you have in your hand, and the entire deck is humans, literally. The only deck, or the only cards that aren't human are the other Doppler, uh, and the Roach, and the Roach should never be in your hand. So, this card, if you draw it in round one, is always a 10, unless you draw the other Doppler, in which case you got two nines in your hand. Um, this is another card that's really good against Dominance, because you get to turn one, play a nine, and that's crazy good. Um, so obviously very good against monsters, really good against every deck because it's just a high point bomb that you get to play on uh, turn one. Um, and this this is what helps you win round one. If you can deny riders in round one, which you typically can because if you play a nine or ten point Doppler in turn one, your opponent's not going to be able to beat that. They'll try to play other cards. Uh, and th this is where I I've talked about this a bit. Winning coin flip uh, up until this meta has been going second. Going second was winning coin flip because it means you got to control the length of round one. Not anymore. Winning coin flip, at least in this current meta when I'm talking today, going first is better and here's why. Because of the Detlaf meta and because every Detlaf deck runs riders, if you can deny your opponent from playing riders in round one, you deny an eight point play and it bricks a card in their hand in round one. Um, so having that tactical advantage allows you to consistently have high unit they can never get riders out and it usually means you win round one um so winning coin flip is actually going first which is really bizarre because for the past two two and a half years of gwent that has not been the case so yeah dopplers are really good against uh, monsters because of dominance um you slam this on turn one it's a good card i it's a 10 for six it's a nine for six phenomenal card i don't think I need to sell it any more than that. Infiltrator, solid for for four. Uh, messes your opponent's deck up. It's a good card. It's a human. Why not? Nazca Sergeant, the only engine in this deck. Um, the thing is, there's no other four point human. If there was a five point human card that I could replace Nazca Sergeant with, I would. But I can't because they don't exist. The the closest thing would be a Slave Driver, which is a four for four because I don't run any locks. You could run Magni Division, but you're once again walking into it being an engine. Um, you could play the new Crimson Curse card where if your opponent plays a six, uh, it gets six value for four, which is okay, but you can't bank on that. Whereas Nausicaa Sergeant, I just mulligan these away against Detlaf because they're never going to live. Uh, playing an engine against Detlaf is kind of pointless because you play and your opponent removes it and they get to trade up, right? So if you play this and they play a Regis, they just trade it up on you by four points. Technically five, I guess. Um, but four points. Um... Yeah, so obviously Nausicaa Sergeant uh, isn't very good against that lap, unless you go first. Uh, if you go first, I typically slam Doppler if I have Doppler, or I'll just Tactical Advantage Sergeant, because they can't remove it, and I get Dominance, or I get to deny their Dominance. So Nausicaa Sergeant is a good card to hold against that lap in round one if you're going first. Uh, if, you're, if you're not going first, I suggest mulliganing this card 100% of the time against that lap, because it will never live. Um... Because you're not playing any other engine, so when this gets played, it'll get removed. Don't keep this card in your opening hand unless you're going first. Cutthroat and uh, Oxenfurt Scholar. So Cutthroat's pretty good with um, Gorgon, obviously, because you get to bleed and you get to damage a unit by two eventually, and you get to find that Gorgon, or yeah, that Gorgon value. Um, but the important thing about these two cards is they're both humans, and they're five for fours, and five for four is good because the other fours suck um so it, it, it's that simple it's a five for four it allows you to find it, it also helps with dominance right if your opponent has a eight on the board and you have an eight on the board you can play scholar and boost that eight up by plus two but initially by plus one and once again you have dominance and we i'm trying to make it very clear dominance is everything against monsters you deny dominance you can win the game off of it um because when, when you beat monsters with this deck, you don't win by 30 points. That's not going to happen. You're not. It's not a blowout. You're going to win by anywhere between like one and like eight points. Uh, and every point matters. So denying that proto flutter three points could win you the game. Um, and this is where having dominance or denying dominance is huge. Um, and typically having highest unit is very good because it means they can never play Count Caldwell. So the, the base is 10. You basically always want to have a 10 on the board, except in round one. Round one, you don't really need to have a 10 on board. But like once you get to round three, you always want a 10 so that they can never play Caldwell. To the point where if I'm in round three and have Count Caldwell, I will turn one Caldwell because it means they can't play their Caldwell. Um, 
because if they do, it's a 50% chance it flips, and this is assuming I have an emissary. So, um, in terms of late game, round three, what do you want in your hand? Obviously, you want gold cards. That's not really a question. And you want emissary. You want at least one emissary because it guarantees your Gorgon. Um, and more importantly, it allows you to keep that Caldwell or deny their Caldwell. So, emissary, I typically never want to play two emissaries in round one or two. I like to hold at least one, if not both, for round three to guarantee that I get the Caldwell off. Uh, in terms of gameplay, Slam Doppler's on turn one. It's pretty straightforward. If you have tactical advantage on turn two, you can throw it on a Nausicaa Sergeant uh, and start bleeding because they, they're they not going to be able to keep up with you. All their cards trade up against engines, but if you never play an engine, they can never trade up. They can never play riders. Yeah, you just typically win round one. The, the, the rounds where you don't win round one is where they go first because they turn one riders and you don't get to deny that. And that's an eight point play. So, um, and that's, that's where it gets fun. So if you, if you go second, right, or sorry, if you go, yes, if you go second, sorry, I, it's a little late at night. If you go second and your opponent obviously played riders, it's going to be harder to win round one. Uh, and so typically I'll pass on seven card, six card. And then this is where monsters go into high gear and they push you because they're monsters and they play big boys and they like to push. Uh, and this is where you punish the shit out of them because you play cards like Count Caldwell and that's a lot of points. Um, or you play like Jermaine, which is an eight. And typically I don't pull Roach in round one because I play three bronzes, three or four bronzes in round one. Uh, and they start pushing me and I punish the shit out of them. More often than not, I get out of round two a card up against monsters. I know that sounds crazy, but it happens very, very often. I, it does mean you need to you need to play uh, proactively and sometimes ahead in points. So sometimes you'll only be like two points ahead and you'll slam a Jermaine and you're thinking, well, why on earth would you do that? You could just play like a four point bronze to keep up. Well, the problem is if your opponent plays like a 10 point card the turn after, uh, you might not necessarily be able to keep up. Whereas if you have a Jermaine on the board, you could play something like a Slave Infantry or you can play Vivian to boost a Jermaine up to 11. Uh, so you, you need to give yourself the potential to catch up uh, if they do play a large point card. Um, this intro is a little bit longer than most of my normal videos because I, I, I kind of wanted to talk about the deck a little bit more because I know there are going to be people who watch this video. They're going to queue this deck, they're going to play against monsters, and they're going to lose, and they're going to be very mad. Um, yeah, I, I want to stress once again, it's not an auto win. You don't just win the game. You do have to navigate the deck well, and you do need to play around dominance. I, I Hopefully, I've stressed that enough. Dominance is everything for this deck against monsters. You need to, you need to keep dominance. Um, so yeah, I have four videos for you today. Um, all four of them are against Detlaf with this deck. I will be showing two in this video and I will show the other two tomorrow just to split it up so that it's not too overwhelming. Um, hopefully you guys learned something from it. Maybe not. We'll see. Um, yeah. I hope you guys enjoy the videos and I'll see you guys on the next one. Oh, it's Freddy. Humans, you are all the same. Docs, we know he has trees. Get them, boys. They started playing Knackers. Hmm. I mean, if they do, Squirtle gets a little better because of Archers. Because, like, day one, day two, day three. Knackers saw no play. Try to need help. I want to see my win rate, but I can't find my name in leaderboards. It reads, I need to rank. Reach rank 25 for it to show, but I'm already rank 7. Can you help? Wait. You can literally just look at the bottom. It's just... Look at your name and it'll show your win rate. Right? Oh, seems like everybody's clients are bugged. I always find a way in. 
Here a bug, there a bug, everywhere. That laugh. Oh, your name doesn't show up? Well, then it's a bug on CDPR's end, I think. Nemo8, thank you so much for the six months. Feels good to be a pumpkin sub again. Thanks, man. Appreciate the resub. How do you see sub uh, win rate? Oh, Adrian, the infiltrator. Wait, why doesn't Freddy have the Crimson Curse card back? Honey? Cause he's smart. Oh, shit. Spending forty dollars for a card back, but if you're a streamer, like I don't know, is he going deep? Are you are you gonna go deep, Freddy? You're gonna go below seven, the magic number. Yeah. Spending money on things isn't cool. Earning them is cool. Yeah, but you can't earn them, so. Priest or Rogue? I'm looking forward to Warlock next expansion. The new shuffle card is dope. Like, time warp card. Time I taught you some respect! You earn things with money? There you go. I strive above all to be just. Why does this deck run Cowdwell? Because I need points against monsters. <laughs> Godwell's at 10 for 8, so in theory, these points. This is so risky. So if I, okay, so if I play the 5, hold on. If I just flip Caldwell. The zero point play. Five buff count. I'm 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 aware, but I don't want to do it yet, right? I want to wait a turn. So the question is, am I willing to take a 50-50 against Freddy? Because if I play slate, because I, I can wait a turn on Emmy in theory, right? If I play this on this and he passes, this goes to ten and it's a fifty-fifty. Ah, uh, we'll take the safe play. My RNG isn't good enough. I don't think he plays COC and Geralt. If he plays COC and Geralt, I'd be very surprised. There's the Infiltrator. To keep on a short leash. Oi, Freddy, stop playing cards. I sense your fear. Mate, I see your fear. 
I think we win. We draw Shaylord and Gorgon. I think it's game. Freddy's a smart lad. He'll play around Shaylord. I'm losing one point on Doppler, but I lose so many points if I play around. He knows we play Gorgon. I mean, if we're playing Emissaries, it makes sense that we play Gorgon. So he should play around it. If he has some kind of boost, he'll probably boost it. Oh, he needs high unit. Oh, he probably has, like, Caldwell. But it's a one-point Caldwell, so we win. GG. His last card's one point, so it's not going to do anything. It's probably a one-point Caldwell. He gets to keep it, but this is worth Oh. One point night. Why would you hit the road triple cards? Yes. Easy. Yeah, that cowboy won me the game. Chad is frying pumpkin's brain because I know that no matter how I explain it, Chad's just gonna take it as an excuse. So, like, there's no point in trying to argue with this chat. It's a lost cause. Again. Because at the end of the day, actions speak louder than words, and I lost. Which means nothing I say will counteract that in chat's mind. And here come the truers. Oh, we got the not false gang in chat too. You have to try his deck. I mean, we could. If I play it though, I'm not gonna play Call of the Forest. I refuse to play that card in that deck. I have to do it. I don't mind doing it because if he plays Gimpy, I want to get it out now for slaves. Um, but more importantly, I need to rip Roach out, and we're never playing Vivian, we're never playing Shelight, and we're never playing Peter, so I have to do it because I need to try to win this round. If this deck beats monsters, I'm changing my no unit cancer woodland deck to no unit baldy boy. 
Yeah, but no unit Baldy Boy is shit. Er, sorry. Yeah, no, no unit Baldy Boy is shit. Another correct statement. If not by strength, then by stealth. Because no unit deck doesn't work in Usurper, right? Usurper doesn't have a deck to do it. Usurper doesn't have a removal like Monsters does. Also, Monsters has immune units, whereas Nilfgaard does not. Yeah, he's just bleeding himself down to seven and passing. The question is, is do I dry pass him? You think I can win, win the Cabo War with double Emmy? What? Who dares? So the way I lose this game is I get greedy with Cabo, go to round three, boost it with an Eki, or not an Eki, an Emissary, and he has Geralt. And I think he does play uh, Geralt, so. I'm gonna play around the Geralt and play it this round. I think we have to. We're all dressed up just for you. I sense your fear. I see your fear. No thanks. No interest in this round. We got two cones out of him. Wait. Ah, oh, shit. He's playing his CC deck, isn't he? If he's playing... Uh, he might be playing his CC deck, which is really scary. I want that Slaver Doppler. I think he's playing, which means he's playing, I mean, so on day one we lost to Adzikov because he was running R&R. &R. He might be running R&R &R again, and that would be very sad. That would be very sad, man. Turn on Cowball, he'll probably consume it next turn with Crone. He knows I play Emissary, it's risky holding on to it. And you don't want to consume too much, otherwise I get too much Peter value. So in theory we should see. Okay, I mean he can wait a turn. But it is kind of risky leaving that Caldwell up, and he can't consume it. I mean, if he was planning on Cyclopsing it, he would play it on front row. He can consume with Crone, but it's a triple consume rate. Right? Which means really big Peter value for me. So... I don't know. I don't know what his plan with. Maybe he runs lock? Maybe he has a lock. That could be it. She laid his nine. It's not very good. Get this going. Play back there to play on Cyclops. Hopefully he doesn't have another uh plumber. CC? Oh he has the double vampire. If it's CC he wants to rip now. He's running Crimson Curse, he should... Well, he's not playing R&R. &R. If he was playing R&R, &R, he would have played it already. If he's playing CC... You rip CC here on Cowball. Immediately. Play around Gorgon? No. Because I play Cows. There's no reason to play around Gorgon. It was a short round, maybe. But it's not a short round. Time for a beating. Sure. He took so long because he's worried about slaves, which, I mean, he should be, because I do play slaves. You won't take us alive. What do you mean it's plus 8 on Shuler, 7 on Roach? 
Plus eight on Shelaid, plus seven on Roach. Oh, 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 you mean right now? Yeah, I could do it right now. The, okay, so here's the one reason I don't want to do it right now. You're right, it is more points. But if I want to steal this cow while it's incorrect, because Roach goes to 10, whereas this only goes to 9. That was my thought process. Right. But yes, it is more points to go on Shelaid. But I do want to, I want, because if I steal the cow while I auto win the game, right? Jermaine goes to 11, so it's better. Yep. Jermaine's the best. But the thing is, I'm just going to keep waiting, because the longer I wait, the lower the odds of him being able to get rid of Caldwell. Right, unless, of course, he runs Dora Gary, but Dora Gary doesn't feel correct. Every turn I wait lowers the odds that he can... Uh, Deny it, and I like that. We'll start going now, though. Yes. This will get Geralted, and then I will play the one drop and boost this up, and then that will get killed, and then I'll play this, and I sh that should... Well, then it's a 33%er. She was more on Shelaid. Yeah. <laughs> All right, gimme, gimme. Come to Papa. Wait, Your Excellency. I'm falling behind. I guess we win. Unless he can seal it back somehow. His last card is Spear Tip. Easy pass. Well, if his last card is Spear Tip, I lose. But passing does play around Caldwell Flipping. Play any card and claim win? That's not true. If his last card is Spear Tip, I lose. This deck is too heavy to play Spear Tip, I think, but I could be very wrong. Hold Gorgon for Spear Tip. Well, that's why I was considering holding Gorgon for Spear Tip. But, okay, so, right, what I was thinking of is if I hold Gorgon for Spear Tip, I'm okay. But if it's, like, Karen, I lose the game, right, because I would have played Peter. Right? So, like, I don't know. Like, there's different cases for each thing. Um, if his last card is Karen, I need to play Gorgon there. If his last card is Spear Tip, I need to play Peter there to play around Gorgon. But if his last card is Azrael, then I need to be playing... Uh, Gorgon first, right? So, like, I don't know. I was running through the numbers, and the odds of him having Spear Tip, in my opinion, seems kind of low. Because he was playing a bunch of golds. So. Okay. GG. There were literally zero your shield hit Regis. Regis. If you believe in any gods, pray to them now. Oh. Yeah, you're right. Okay. So I did a lot more unnecessary thinking than I needed to do. <laughs>